Thank you. So, but people are still coming in. Okay, so should try I to wait come a in efficiently minutes? and look for empty seats. I'll just wait a minute. Maybe. Okay, I guess this is take two. So Simone Ajambi will be continuing with the second lecture on higher spins. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, continue from what we left, where we left yesterday. So yesterday we discussed how uh, free ON or UN vector models in three dimensions have uh, precisely the right spectrum of operators to be dual to uh, higher spin theories in ADS4 of the Vasiliev type which we haven't uh, described in detail yet. Um, we also mentioned uh, that you, you can have not just free vector model, but also a critical vector model, if you consider the Wilson-Fisher interacting fixed point, and that on the ADS side should correspond to changing boundary conditions for uh, the bulk scalar field, okay? So, uh, we also briefly mentioned yesterday the case of fermions, so let me just uh, briefly go over that. Uh, in D equal three or in any dimension, we can also consider a free fermion theory, of course. It's also a nice uh, CFT. Uh, so let's briefly discuss that. Let me take uh, N free Dirac fermions uh, with a UN symmetry. Uh, so this is the free Dirac action. I could write it down in any dimension. I'm, uh, I'm just uh, specializing to D equal three here, and uh, so since this is a free CFT, as in the case of the scalar theory we discussed yet yesterday, we expect that there are uh, an infinite tower of conserved higher spin currents in this theory, and indeed one can find them, uh, just schematically, let me write them down. So this theory has uh, the following operators. So again, this is just meant to be schematic. There are, there is one gamma matrix and that's minus one derivatives. So this is uh, a little different from the expression we saw yesterday for scalars where we have S derivatives and uh, bilinear scalars. Here we have S minus one derivatives so that the dimension of these currents is again S plus one as uh, it, it's supposed to be for a conserved current in three dimensional CFT. Uh, so again, these currents are conserved. Um, the dimension is S plus one because in three dimensions, the fermions have dimension one, as you can see from uh, the Lagrangian. And uh, then again, in addition to this operator, there is this uh, uh, scalar operator of dimension two now. Well, in the free scalar theory that we saw yesterday, there was a uh, scalar operator of dimension one. Here we have a scalar oper operator of dimension two. So by the same arguments uh, uh, I was giving, well, first let me say that these are all the single trace operators of the theory. 
that we have in three dimensions. By the same argument uh, discussed yesterday, um, you expect that uh, the dynamics of these operators, their correlation functions, should be described by a dual theory in ADS, which is again in higher spin theory, where these cur conserved currents correspond to some higher spin gauge fields, and the scalar operator corresponds to some bulk scalar field. Okay, but there is a difference compared to the uh, scalar case that I was discussing yesterday, uh, in that the scalar operator is a pseudo scalar. So the ma a mass term in three dimensions is parity odd. So this is a parity odd operator, and it's supposed to be dual to a parity uh, to, a, to a pseudo scalar in ADS4. So the dual of this theory, whatever it is, should be already different in the spectrum compared to the scalar theory I was discussing yesterday. And that's not the only difference. Uh, also, if you just if you look at correlation functions of these operators, they are different from the one of the scalar theory. Uh, for example, take the three-point function of the stress tensor. This we already discussed yesterday. If just in this CFT, this free fermion, you calculate this TTT correlation function, this is different from the one of the free scalar, uh, which we already also discussed yesterday because I said that a general, in a general CFT, TTT is a linear combination of these two structures, which are two different structures. So in particular, the cubic coupling of the dual theory to this uh, CFT is different from the cubic coupling of the one dual to the scalars. So there should be two inequivalent higher spin theories in ADS4. Uh, one should be dual to the scalars that I was discussing yesterday, and one should be dual to this theory. Uh, so yesterday I, was, I just mentioned, I just was just talking about Poissonic Vasile theory in ADS4 as if there was only one, but to be more precise, there are actually two, uh, uh, two Vasilev theories in ADS4 which preserve parity. They are called type A and type B, and uh, the spectrum differ precisely in this way, that one has a pseudo-scalar and one has a scalar, and the interactions are different, okay? Um, so indeed, this is, I will uh, define later today what is this type B theory. So this is supposed to be dual to type B theory, type B Basilev theory, dual to three fermions, uh, UN or ON, depending on uh, whether you consider Dirac or Majorana fermions. And uh, the one I discussed yesterday is the type A dual to free or critical uh, scalars. So, um, while the conjecture that type A is dual to free scalar was made by Klebanov and Polyakov, this uh, um, extension of that conjecture was made by, first by Setskin, Sandel, and Lee and Petko, um, who realized that there is this type B version of Vasilev theory and it has precisely the right structure to be dual to this. Okay, so here I wrote free, but as we discussed yesterday, you can also imagine that we can consider an interacting theory similar to what we were discussing yesterday for the scalars. So we can also have a critical, free or critical fermions. And uh, again, the way that you can get interacting theory You can consider the gross novo model where you add quartic interaction. Then unlike the case of the scalar that we discussed yesterday, this quartic interaction is irrelevant in dimension, dimensions between two and four. Uh, but in, if you analyze this theory in the large N expansion, you see that there is a, a UV fixed point. It's UV because it's irrelevant, so there is no IR fixed point here. So there is a UV fixed point uh, where uh, 
the dimension of the scalar operator goes from one, from two to one. And uh, the higher spin currents, as in the case of the uh, Wilson Fisher fixed point, are still approximately conserved. So the dimension is s plus one for plus uh, one over n corrections. So again, because this is a type of double trace deformation of our model, in the bulk, what this corresponds to is changing boundary conditions uh, for the operate for the field in the bulk, which is dual to this operator. So in this case, delta equal two boundary condition corresponds to the free theory, and delta equal one boundary condition corresponds to the interacting theory. Okay. Um, let me just mention here that, uh, as uh, uh, Igor mentioned in his talk, there is a perhaps also nicer description of this fixed point, which is as a conventional IR fixed point of a different theory, which is a Grosnowo-Yukawa theory. This is just a parent parenthetical remark. So we can describe this fixed point starting from this model. So we start with a theory which has n fermions plus one extra massless scalar with some interactions. Which are the only uh, marginal inter interaction which are marginal and equal four uh, consistent with the symmetry. And then you can develop a four minus epsilon expansion similar to uh, the Wilson Fisher fixed point these uh, interactions are relevant in dimension below four. So you expect that this theory with this interaction flows from a free UV fixed point, which is a free theory of n fermions plus one scalar, to an interacting fixed point. And this interacting fixed point can be shown uh, to be equivalent to the UV fixed point of this model. Yes? Uh, yes, you want to describe a CFT, so the mass we, we tune to zero so that we have a conformal field theory. You can start with zero mass and use a regularization where this kind of, uh, because it's not a marginal term, it's a relevant term, you can tune it. Yes? Yeah. Right, right. But the statement is that the fixed points uh, describe the same CFT. So you can compare, for example, operator dimensions or uh, correlation functions, and they are the same. Here you can do one over n expansion in any dimension. Here you can do four minus epsilon expansion to any order that you want for finite n, and then see that the two things always give the same result. Okay, so here we have an IR fixed point, which is supposed to be equivalent to that UV fixed point. This is just uh, something that maybe is not very well known, uh, but uh, it's perhaps a more um, satisfactory way of describing this fixed point because it's a, it's a conventional flow from a free UV theory to an IR interacting theory, much like the Wilson Fisher fixed point. Okay. In any case, it's clear from this description that in, since in this description this is a double trace deformation, we know what to do in the bulk, in the one over n expansion. We are changing the boundary condition for the scalar field. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, let me also mention something else. So, uh, while the, the free uh, scalar theory is so we discussed it in the equal three yesterday. We could discuss it in any dimension, and uh, everything I said yesterday could be repeated in any dimension. The spectrum is always given by totally symmetric traceless uh, conserved currents plus one scalar. That's true in any dimension. This uh, fermion model is a little different. 
So it's only, uh, only in the equal three that the spectrum uh, is very similar to the scalar theory. If you go to general dimension, there are more operators. For example, in d equal four, there is an extra operator like this, uh, which in d equal three is not independent because this is related by duality to a single gamma mu. And there are in general operators with many derivatives. So besides those, there are also these, which are dual to mixed symmetry. Mixed symmetry, higher spin fields. In, a, in this case, in ADS5. You can do this in, high, in any dimension. Uh, go higher and higher, you have more and more operators because you can put uh, uh, several of these gammas together. So in general dimension, this free fermion theory is not dual to uh, a Vasiliev theory which is currently known. It's some theory which include regular totally symmetric fields plus mixed symmetry fields <coughs> and a nonlinear Vasiliev theory for this kind of uh, uh, higher spin fields is not known, okay? While for the scalars, which is what we call type A, there is a uniform generalization to all dimensions, which is known, okay? Any questions? Okay. Uh, so it just means, so, okay, let, let me schematically do something like this. So an operator like this, would correspond to a young tableau of this type. So it's not totally symmetric, uh, and we call it mixed, this is called mixed symmetry. Uh, it is symmetric under these indices and anti-symmetric here. It corresponds to this young tableau. Well, the, the simplest type of higher spin fields are the ones which are totally symmetric. Okay. Yes? A little bigger. A little bigger, okay. Uh, this, <laughs> or oh, in general, <laughs> in general. <laughs> 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 All right, bigger, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so do you have problems seeing from up there a little bit? Okay, okay, so, mm. so let me go here. Before we move on, just uh, write down a table summarizing all the dualities that we have uh, discussed so far. Okay, so I'll call this the klebanov foliakov uh, setkin sandel lee petko dualities. Okay, uh, so we have bigger Vasiliev. Type A, Vasilia, Type B, and here we have the choice of boundary conditions for the scalar field. I should say that since in this, both in the scalar and the fermion model, the dimension is either one or two, the bulk scalar field always has the same mass, which is m squared equal minus two, as we discussed yesterday. But uh, it's a pseudo scalar in type A and it's a regular scalar in type, uh, the other way around. It's a pseudo scalar in type B and the regular scalar in type A. Okay, so if we choose multiple one here, we're discussing the free uh, scalar. And here we're discussing the critical scalar. And here the situation is just reversed as we discussed. So delta equal one corresponds to the critical fermion, which is either the UV fixed point of gross nouveau or the IR fixed point of this gross nouveau Yukawa model. And for delta equal two, we are discussing the free fermions. Okay. 
So that's a summary of what we discussed so far. Uh, so any questions about the table? One can also play with the changing boundary conditions for fields of higher spin. If you change boundary condition for fields of spin one, uh, that means that you are adding a double trace deformation, which is the square of the spin one current. And if you introduce the hubbard stratonovich auxiliary field, uh, that can be seen to be related to a critical <coughs> QED model coupled to the N fermions. So that's also another theory that uh, uh, you can describe in the same framework. Okay. Okay, so before we, we move on to describe, hopefully to reach the structure of Azilev theory, uh, let me finish by just making a couple of comments. So first, uh, we already said yesterday, but let me say again, why we are considering vector models. So the reason we're considering vector models, as we discussed yesterday, is that the spectrum of uh, single trace operators, UN invariant or ON invariant, is very simple. They're just the bilinears, okay? So only bilinears. And so these single trace objects are dual to the single particle states in the bulk. Uh, if we have objects with more than two of these fields, like uh, phi i, phi i, phi j, let's say I put some derivative, phi j. This is to be viewed as a, um, in this case, double trace object, or in general, multi-trace object. It will correspond to some multi-particle state in the bulk, okay? So the spectrum of vector models is very simple at the single trace level, and that's why they can be dual to pure, simple, higher spin gauge theories of Vasiliev type, okay? If we add a um, matrix type free theory, then we would still have some conserved currents uh, schematically of this form. This is uh, familiar in gauge theories. Uh, even in n equal four superior mills, they're the twist, so-called twist two operators. They are conserved currents, and they will be dual to some massless uh, gauge fields. But the spectrum of single trace operators in this matrix type theories is more complicated because there are also uh, many, many more operators which are not conserved currents, uh, uh, like. Uh, string any matrices, number of uh, matrices that you want, take a single trace, that's still a single trace operator. It should be dual uh, to some single particle state, but it's not a conserved current, it's a massive state. Massive field in the bulk. So the dual to matrix type theories in the weak coupling yeah. limit should uh, include both higher spin gauge fields and a very large tower of massive fields. While vector models don't have this uh, feature, the spectrum is very simple. Okay. Okay. The other comment I wanted to make is about uh, the restriction to singlet sector, which I sort of was doing by hand. I was declaring that I was only looking at operators which are UN or ON invariant. Uh, 
uh, you can say that you do this by hand, but a fruitful, um, interesting way to think about this is that you should regard this UN or ON symmetries as gauged, and then, uh, uh, then it's natural to just look at gauge invariant operators and define these free theories as uh, the free limit of a gauge theory, free limit of a ON or UN gauge theory. In three dimensions, we can do this naturally by coupling these vector models to chain simons gauge fields. So we can take this model, uh, just the chain simons section. write it down in the case of fermions. Okay, so you can start with this more general theory in which you include a gauge field, uh, say a UN chern simons gauge field, and then it's a gauge theory, you're supposed to only look at gauge invariant operators, and uh, then you can define that theory to be the limit of this theory where you send the Toothed coupling, which for chern simons theory is n over k, displays the role of a coupling constant, is like 1 over g square. Uh, so that theory is the limit as lambda going to 0. Of uh, this theory. Okay, so that's one way to define what is the singlet sector of that theory. You start with, you, you gauge the ON or UN symmetry and then you consider the free, free gauge theory limit. But this then naturally suggests that it may be interesting to study this theory more generally at finite lambda. Okay, so that's something that I'm not sure I'm going to talk about in detail. I don't know if I will have time. Uh, so, you would expect that once you include this uh, coupling and you keep lambda to be finite, you would expect that the higher spin symmetry is uh, badly broken. But in fact, this uh, does not happen. Uh, it can be shown in this, in this vector type theories, where chern simons is coupled to a vector model, it can be shown that even at finite lambda, uh, the higher spin operators are uh, in the large end limit are still approximately conserved, I'm not sure if you can all read this, but the structure here is similar to what I was discussing yesterday for the critical scalar. So what happens in these vector models is that the, the, the non-conservation equation for the current is always such that here you have a double trace operator on the right hand side, and then this non-conservation is uh, suppressed in the large end limit and it, it implies that uh, the dimension of these currents is still S plus 1, uh, plus 1 over n, not the same F. So strictly in the large N limit, these are still conserved currents. So th that led to the proposal that these models at finite lambda and large N are still dual to higher spin theories. Uh, where, so the higher spin fields are still uh, massless at the classical level, still dual to higher spin uh, theories. It's neither type A or type V, obviously, but it turns out that there are uh, appropriate Vasiliev theories which uh, fit the features of these theories. In particular, they break, they break parity. So in three dimension chain Simon's term breaks parity. So we need some kind of parity breaking uh, higher spin theory in ADS4. And there is such a theory. It's neither type A or type B. It's a theory which depends on some extra parameters which could map to this lambda. Okay, so, <coughs> so this point of view of thinking a little more carefully how to impose the singlet sector constraint led to some generalization of these conjectures where we relate uh, vector models coupled to Fern Simons to some more general Vasilev theories which break parity in ADS4. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes.
yes. Then, then in that you will have fermionic operators in that theory. Correct. And yes, they, they, at least in the free limit, they will, you will have some higher spin theory which has uh, both bosonic and fermionic higher spin currents. So you keep on Th there are such theories, yes. Yes. Basically, for any free theory you can think of, uh, there, there should be a higher spin theory. It may not be known at a nonlinear level, but you can identify the spectrum for sure. Yes? Sorry, I'm not sure I caught the question. Matrix type, yes. Well, so if you have, for example, n equal four super Yamils, then we know it should be dual to type two B string theory on ADS five cross S five. You can do a reduction on the S five. Uh, the statement is that that theory should be dual to some uh, in the weak coupling limit should be dual to some higher spin theory in ADS five, uh, which uh, has higher spin fields and a lot of extra operators. Some of them will come from the Kaluza Klein uh, reduction on the five sphere. <coughs> okay, so if there are no other questions, um, move on. And now we'll leave the CFT for a while and uh, discuss. Uh, uh, some something about higher spin uh, gauge fields. Trying to hopefully move towards introducing the Zilliff equations. Okay, so let's start by reviewing something basic, which is uh, equation for free higher spin fields. And let me start first in, uh, in flat space. Uh, so the familiar examples are, of course, uh, uh, spin one, which is the Maxwell theory, in which we have uh, the familiar gauge symmetry and uh, uh, equation of motion, uh, which are just this, or in terms of A, So this is the equation, uh, the free equation for a massless uh, spin one field. Or spin two, uh, we can think of linearized gravity. So, um, so we linearize the Einstein equation. Uh, by setting the metric to be, I'm, I'm doing here first flat space. So then the linearized equation for the, gra uh, for the graviton uh, which if you never derived, I suggest you do as an exercise. Uh, so if you linearize the uh, Einstein equations around flat space, you get this, this wave equation for the, uh, 
for the fluctuation of the metric, which has the familiar uh, gauge symmetry with a spin one uh, gauge parameter. Okay, so uh, how do we, how to generalize this to arbitrary spin uh, in writing down some gauge invariant equations for uh, propagate free higher spin fields? That uh, uh, was done uh, by Franz Dahl. Okay, so Franz Dahl. So to write down gauge invariant equations of motion and uh, Lagrangian for uh, uh, higher spin fields, Franz Dahl, well, he, I'm not going to derive this. He derived this starting from the massless, taking the massless limit of uh, massive higher spin particles. I'm just, I'm just going to give you the result. So uh, this higher spin fields are described and I, I will focus on the totally symmetric case. Described by fields which are totally symmetric with S indices and they are double traceless. So double traceless means that if you take the trace twice, you get zero. This constraint uh, is uh, empty in the case of spin one, spin two, and spin three, but it becomes uh, non-trivial in the case of, of spin four and higher. So we have this constraint on the front of fields, and uh, the gauge invariance by generalizing uh, what you know for spin one and spin two, it's uh, not surprising Guess the following gauge invariance. Okay, with a spin s minus one parameter, and uh, And then the gauge invariant equation of motion found by Frost, they'll take the following form. Uh, so we define this tensor G, which is a generalization of the um, linearized uh, Einstein tensor. So box. Minus S. So I'm just uh, going to write down this in completeness, even though it may be a little painful, but just at least for free fields, you should see what the wave equation look like for higher spin fields. Okay, so that's the equation that Franz Dahl found. And uh, you should uh, try to take the gauge variation of this equation of motion uh, using that uh, gauge transformation to show that the gauge variation of this is S, S minus one, S minus two divided by two. And here there are, okay, the details do not matter too much except that here you get the trace of the gauge parameter. So uh, in order for this to be gauge invariant, you have to restrict the gauge parameter to be traceless. Okay, so the generalization of uh, um, the spin uh, zero, spin one and spin two gauge symmetry involves uh, a spin S minus one gauge parameter, which is supposed to be traceless for gauge invariance to work, okay? And uh, these equations can be derived from uh, a Lagrangian 
that was indeed, I think, uh, one of the main points of Franz Ball paper is that uh, you can have some Lagrangian, uh, Lagrangian equation of motion for these massless fields. And the Lagrangian has the following form or action. So that's the Franz Dahl action, and uh, uh, again, similarly to here, you can verify that it's gauge invariant, and the gauge invariance requires both tracelessness of epsilon and double tracelessness of, of phi. So that's where the double tracelessness uh, constraint also comes from. It's for gauge invariance of this action. Okay, so that's the fully off-shell uh, uh, gauge invariant equation. Then we can fix a gauge and describe uh, a simpler, as usual, a simpler wave equation for gauge fixed uh, dynamics. And uh, we can gauge fix, so gauge fixed on shell equation, we can gauge fix phi to be transverse and traceless, then the equation of motion simplify to a usual wave equation Uh, um, well, it may be called a Pauli Firth equation. Pauli and Firth wrote some, something like this equation for massless spin 2. It is like a massless uh, Pauli Firth equation. It describes a gauge fixed version of Franz Dahl equation. If you study propagating degrees of freedom, you see that these uh, equations describe consistently propagation of uh, two helicities in four dimensions plus minus s helicities. So these are consistent equations which describe propagations of uh, massless iron spin fields of any spin in flat space. Okay. Now the question, so this is flat space, what happens if we want to put this, actually th this is just ordinary derivative here. What happens if we want to put this on a curved background? Uh, so how do we uh, generalize this? Your yeah, question? No. Um, Okay, so what you would do to covariantize, of course, uh, follow, following the usual rules, uh, you should replace derivatives by covariant derivatives. Okay, schematically. Uh, but if you do that, you'll soon discover that these equations are not gauge invariant anymore. There is no way to make them gauge invariant uh, in. Uh, for an arbitrary metric. If you, put, if you do this covariantization in the action and uh, study the gauge variation, then you find that the gauge variation involves the Riemann tensor contracted in some way with phi and uh, the gauge parameter. Okay, I mean schematic here. Point is that the gauge variation involves the Riemann tensor. And <coughs> for general, completely arbitrary metric, uh, there is no way to compensate that. Okay, so it's not possible to make these uh, higher spin equations uh, consistent in an arbitrary background, except for spin one and spin two, of course. And that is expected because if we were able to do that, it would mean that we could uh, write down consistent interactions of uh, higher spins with gravitons. But in flat space, there's supposed to be no uh, non-trivial S matrix for uh, higher spin particles interacting with gravity. So th this is physically is related to that. Here technically you see that uh, these equations cannot be made gauge invariant. Okay, so the only uh, way out is when this Riemann tensor is uh, 
very simple, like maximally symmetric space. Then this Riemann tensor is a product of uh, two metrics. And then this variation just gives some mass-like terms in the Lagrangian, which you can uh, cure by adding some extra quadratic term in higher spin gauge fields. So I think this cannot be seen very well. <laughs> So only possibility is a maximally symmetric space. So of course flat or the sitter or anti the sitter. Okay. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, then the action can be made gauge invariant provided you slightly correct this tensor that I defined there. So uh, say there will be the one, the covariantization plus a correcting term which is quadratic. It's a correcting term which is linear in G and it will give an extra mass term in the, in the Lagrange. Okay. The point, the physical important point is that you can put, you can make this uh, higher spin massless particle propagate consistently only in flat space or anti the sitter space or the sitter space. In uh, general space, there is, you don't have gauge invariance and then uh, you cannot decouple the physical polarizations of these particles. So it will describe an inconsistent theory. Any question? Okay. Okay, so let me not write down the full correction here, but let me just write down the gauge fixed equations in ADS. Yes? Um, first of all, the corner, we can't actually You cannot see here. Yeah, so I it's just a linear term in phi with some coefficient which depends on the spin and the dimension. So you correct this uh, G that I wrote. First you covariantize the derivatives and then you just add the correcting terms, which is uh, a linear in phi, okay? All right. Uh, when you write down the gauge fixed equations in ADS, they look like this. In ADS D plus one, this is uh, the full Franz Del of shell equation I won't really need, but uh, this may come back later. So once you gauge fix it, the equation looks like this. Okay, so this, this mass-like term which appears here uh, arise from this correcting term that you have to put. Uh, but it's not really a mass, this in it, it just comes from the coupling to curvature. I'm setting the uh, radius, curvature radius to, uh, to one here. So it's not a mass, it's, it's just the precise value that it's required for gauge invariance in ADS or in DS. Okay, so here I'm already uh, specializing to ADS. If it's DS, it'll be opposite sign, okay? And this D that I wrote here is D plus one. Okay. Okay, so these are the on-shell equation, well, gauge fixed equation describing massless higher spins in ADS D plus one. Uh, you can uh, study 
for example, take a Poincaré metric of ADS and study how the solutions to these equations behave when you approach the boundary. Uh, so what you find, so take the, in the Poincaré metric, then phi, just being schematic here, for small z behaves like the delta minus s, uh, some alpha, which only depends on x. And this delta, uh, so by solving these equations, you find an equa uh, uh, some quadratic equation for delta, which generalizes the one for scalars that I wrote the other <coughs> in the other lecture, and looks like this. where k is this. Okay. And then you find that the solutions uh, are in indeed correspond to delta equal s plus d minus 2, which is the dimension of a conserved current uh, uh, in the boundary theory. And there is another solution, which is 2 minus s. Okay. So for uh, for spin zero, for example, these are the two solutions which for del in d equal three would be delta equal one and delta equal two. Uh, for spin one, these are the two possible boundary conditions for the, for the spin one field. For higher spin fields, uh, we usually don't impose these boundary conditions, but uh, you actually can also do that. You will describe some induced conformal higher spin theory at the boundary, but I'm not going to discuss that because I don't have time. Okay, so for the usual versions of the duality, we, we will choose uh, this boundary condition for the higher spin fields, which corresponds to having this conserved current in, in the CFT. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so this Franzdahl formulation uh, of higher spin fields is called sometimes metric-like formulation of higher spin because it's a natural generalization of uh, this equation uh, for the fluctuation of the metric. Now, it's, uh, it's a nice formalism to write down uh, free propagation of higher spin fields, but it turns out to be quite hard to write down interactions in this metric-like framework. Uh, so cubic couplings, uh, were written down in this metric-like formalism in ADS, but not a fully nonlinear theory. So what Vasiliev uh, realized is that it's more convenient to adopt a generalization of the so-called frame-like formalism, which is instead of metric, we use Wildbein and spin connection in gravity, and use the language of differential forms. And if you do that, you at the free level, you recover something equivalent to Franzdahl, but it's then uh, easier to write down nonlinear equations. Uh, so I'll try to discuss that now. So frame like So recall that in gravity, we can write down gravity instead of in terms of metric, in terms of uh, a Wildbein and the spin connection, where the mu's are uh, so-called curved indices and A and B are the flat indices, the frame indices, and we have a local Lorentz invariance, and this omega is the uh, gauge field for that. And then it's natural to combine this uh, 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 Wildman and spin connection into a single one form, which I'll denote as W. Uh, so this W. <coughs> mm. 
we are here, N, A, B are the generators of the local Lorentz rotations, and P, A are the generators of the uh, uh, translations. Okay, so the algebra, so if we are working with negative cosmological constant, the algebra satisfied by this P, A and M, A, B is the ADS algebra, and D equal 3 will be SO3, comma 2. So, M are just the usual rotations. Uh, P, trans P transforms, or M rotates P. So this will be the same in, in, uh, in, in zero cosmological constant. The one which is different is the commutator of the translations. Uh, so this is the ADS scale, which usually I set to one, but I'm, I'm putting here uh, for clarity. Okay, so this is the SO3, 2 algebra. Uh, in the flat space case, we could do the same construction, then PA and MAB will generate the Poincaré algebra. This will be zero. And in the, the sitter case, you just have an opposite sign here. Okay, so we can uh, combine E and omega into a single SO3, 2 gauge field if we, if we are discussing gravity with negative cosmological constant. And uh, we can, as we do usually in Young-Mills theories, we can compute the curvature of this gauge field. And uh, this, which is a simple exercise that I leave to you, using that algebra and taking, uh, computing this uh, uh, curvature, you get a term, proportional to the P generators, which is nothing but the torsion. And you get another term which is some kind of uh, generalized Riemann tensor. This is just the usual Riemann curvature to form. And then you have this extra cosmological term, which comes from this commutator. So if this was zero, this wouldn't be there. Okay, so this is the curvature of this field. And then you recognize that uh, uh, a maximally symmetric background in this formalism is just uh, a zero curvature uh, background, okay? So, so the zero curvature condition gives ADS solution. the sitter if you're doing uh, the other sign of the cosmological constant. So this is just a torsion constraint which allows you to solve omega in terms of E. And uh, this is just uh, the condition that the Riemann tensor uh, is related to the metric, essentially. Okay. Okay. So this indeed we'll see later. It's precisely the way in which the ADS solution, ADS background will arise from the Facilier equations. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. So now Vasilev idea is to try to generalize this construction to all spins by including all spins at once into some gauge field W like this. So uh, make something, some al bigger algebra in which we don't have just P and M, and we have an infinite dimensional algebra with all the higher spin fields. And uh, the most convenient way to 
uh, introduce Vasilia formalism in four dimensions is to use uh, two component spinners notation, uh, which I'll just briefly review, but I assume most of you know about. So before we go on, just a quick reminder on two component spinners notation in four dimensions. So this is just the statement that uh, using Pauli matrices we can convert uh, a vector index into a uh, by spinner index. So for example, XA uh, we can convert to X alpha alpha dot by using the Pauli matrices where sigma A is one and sigma and sigma vector are just the usual Pauli matrices. Uh, so this is just, uh, I, I hope a familiar thing that you can do in four dimensions. It's basically a form of the isomorphism SO4 equal SU2 cos SU2. So you, you can split one vector index into the product of uh, one half zero and zero one half representations of uh, SU2 cross SU2. So if we use these notations, Okay. Uh, the field bind which I was writing as EA will be E alpha alpha dot and uh, anti-symmetric tensor omega AB will split into omega alpha beta and omega bar alpha dot beta dot where this is totally symmetric. Okay, you can count that the number of components that you have here uh, which is six is the same as the sum of this plus this, which is three plus three, okay? And so on, you can convert all representations uh, in the vector notations to some uh, spinorial language, okay? So this turns out to be a convenient thing to do, to write down the equations. Uh, so next, uh, Next, we introduce some uh, auxiliary twister variables. And we'll be clear in a second why we are introducing this. So introduce a pair of twister variables which transform in the spinner, spin one half representations, but they are commuting. And uh, on these spinners, we introduce some star product. Star product. You should think of this as exactly as, well, products of this would be related to those generators. So they are like, uh, more like fibers or space time. So th the reason why I'm introducing this is just a convenient way to realize that algebra and then to extend it to higher spins. So uh, introduce this. By definition, we introduce this star product and the same for Bart. Now in the literature here you'll find different conventions for this, but for the purpose of these lectures, factors of I are not so important, but uh, um, maybe a more common convention will have a I here, okay? Uh, okay, so more generally, this is just like 
if we, wa if we have a star product between two functions, afraid this cannot be read easily. Okay, by this CC I just mean the same term for the barred variables. So you have this moyal like star product. It can also be represented um, uh, in integral form, which is a uh, representation which is often used for, for calculations. So this is a formal. We are, I'm assuming that there is a choice of contour here so that this integral converge in particular. So this is defined so that uh, uh, this is true. Okay, contours and normalizations are chosen so that this is true. And this UV just means uh, U alpha V alpha where uh, the, the spinner index are higher than lowered with the epsilon symbol. So this is similar to what, uh, similar to the formalism that Nima was describing yesterday in his lecture. Okay, so mm. now it's easy to see that uh, if you consider bilinears of this wise and Y bars, let me call pa, P alpha alpha dot, Y alpha, Y bar alpha dot, up to normalizations. So if we look at bilinears of these uh, twister variables and uh, we consider their commutators under star product, we see that this uh, star product is defined precisely in such a way that we reproduce the SO3,2 algebra in these two component spinner notations. So for example, M alpha beta, M gamma delta star commutator. So this just means uh, this M star this minus the other way around, so it's a commutator with the star product. Uh, if you do that star product, you see that, uh, so you can use the star product to contract two of the y's, and then you here you'll get an epsilon times an m plus minus the other terms, okay? So this is the two component spinner form of uh, this here. And if you do the other commutators, you reproduce all the rest. For example, P alpha alpha dot, P gamma gamma dot, star commutator. And so in this case, um, well, I, I should perhaps say there that, so I wrote Y star Y and Y bar star Y bar. Y star Y bar is just the ordinary product. Uh, you can see that from the general definition I wrote there, so the star product of y and y bar is trivial. So here we get the star commutator, we get epsilon alpha beta m bar alpha dot beta dot plus the other term, okay? So, so far these twisters, I just introduced them as a way to realize uh, this SO3,2 algebra using star commutators. of P and Q? Uh, well, 
I mean, T is a vector, right? Uh, so it's a product of the alpha and alpha dot representation. I can't see. I mean, I don't know if I got the, got the question right. Yes. So, for example, suppose we have uh, any computer you can think of, you can understand, and you can see <coughs> that there are two of y and two of y plus y. Uh, I mean, I'm just realizing the algebra. So, this is a representation of P, is a particular representation of P. Sorry? When you think of Y as also a representation of P, so as what? Oscillator. Oscillator. Uh, <coughs> yes. Yes? Uh, might a partial answer to Horowitz's question be that if we take that fixed quadratic expression, those fixed quadratic expressions in for P and, and M, that if you then act upon polynomials in Y, say symmetric polynomials with right. indices, that gives you uh, at least a large class of representations of the Lorentz algebra, the unitary ones? Uh, yes, so this in particular, this M will uh, act as a rotation uh, on those indices. If, if you take the commutator of M with an object with more Ys, it will act as a, a rotation generator. Yes. This just follows from this uh, definition of star product. This won't be unitary representation of this. It requires an unitary. You're representing the non compact group as their free two. Yeah. So it's unitary representations of the unitary polynomials. So it's true that the free take polynomials are part of the given representation. Yeah. Yes. Let's see uh, how to extend this to higher spins. So okay, so in this language so far, this just means that we can, instead of uh, writing abstractly W uh, in that form, we can think of W, for the spin two part, we can think of W as uh, a one form which depends on space time and extra auxiliary coordinates such that it's quadratic in y and y bar. So, <coughs> so this will be spin two, gravity and uh, Sorry, uh, Wilbur and spin connection. But then it's natural uh, to generalize this uh, to higher spin by simply saying that we consider uh, an arbitrary function of y and y bar, including all possible powers. And the expansion of that, uh, this function in all possible powers will, uh, the coefficient of that expansion will be fields of higher spin. So if we are bilinear, we just have fields corresponding to spin two if you allow all possible powers of y and y bar, we encode higher spin objects inside W. Okay, so <coughs> yes, I can. So for higher spin now, 
So allow this to be a general function of y and y bar. denotes how many y's are there and m how many y bars are there <coughs> okay so we have this expansion and this coefficient are fields function of x uh, so the bilinear part should just be gravity and uh, in general uh, the term here which has um, n minus m, n, n plus m equal to 2s minus 1 corresponds to a spin s uh, field. Okay, this y is carry spin 1 half. This, you should remember that is uh, one form, so there is an extra index hidden here, a mu, dx mu. And then this uh, packaging, this uh, w in this way, gives a generalization of the Wilbein and spin connection formalism to all spins. So in particular, uh, so just to clarify this, I think I write down So first trivially, we can also include s equal one here. It will be the term which is independent of y and y bar. It's just the one form. So that's uh, w zero zero. S equal two is the one we already described. It will have one one, two zero, and zero two. This is the Wilbein, and these are the spin connections. Okay, now for a higher spin, for example, spin three, you have two comma two, three comma one, four comma zero, one comma three, zero comma four. Okay. This object here, which is an object which looks like E mu alpha 1, alpha 2, comma, alpha 1 dot, alpha 2 dot. This is the, yes? Uh, Did I? Yeah, okay. So uh, n plus m is 2 s minus 1. Okay, so um, you can think of making this, uh, roughly speaking, you can think of making any pair of alpha alpha dot as a vector index. So here you have, uh, uh, sorry, this is an M. And then you have an extra mu there. So, because this is a one form, right? So that's where the minus one come from. And uh, the two is because the each of these carries spin one half. So you see, you see, for example, gravity, it's not uh, two, but one comma one, right? That's the, that's the Wilbein, E alpha alpha dot. And uh, uh, this is the spin three Wilbein. It has one vector index and uh, um, alpha one, alpha two, alpha one dot, alpha two dot. And all these guys are generalization of spin connection. I don't, I don't want to go into too many technical details. So it's just supposed to give an idea of uh, uh, why this is a natural way to generalize the Wilbein and spin connection formalism to all spins, okay? Uh, can, uh, yes, at this level it can. So if we're describing a bosonic theory, there, there will be a constraint that uh, uh, this W is an even function of Y and Y bar. But you can uh, encode uh, half integer spins uh, in fact, this spinner formulation makes that very easy because you just uh, have odd functions of y's, those will be half integer spins, okay? So in general, the component which has s minus one alphas and s minus one alpha dots 
it's like the wheel bind. And after uh, fixing the local Lorentz uh, rotations, you can relate this to the Fransdahl field in the same way as you can go from uh, the Wilbein to the metric. You can go from this uh, Wilbein-like formula formulation to the Fransdahl field at the end of the day, okay? How much more time? Uh, 10 minutes? Okay. So as uh, SO3,2 is the algebra of bilinears of these uh, Ys and Y bars, the higher spin algebra can be defined as the algebra of uh, polynomials, of all polynomials of Y and Y bars. It can be generated by the, the, all the monomials. And W is a gauge field for that algebra. It's gauge transformation. It's the uh, usual one. You'd have a gauge parameter which itself is some gauge parameter which depends on x and these uh, extra variables which play the role of uh, the gauge uh, uh, group generators, right? Plus commutator. So this will be the gauge transformation associated with this W. And uh, if you consider linearized gauge symmetry around ADS, which I haven't shown yet that it's a solution of, I, I even even wrote down Vasiliev equations, but just to anticipate. If you look at this gauge transformation and here you put the ADS vacuum and uh, you, then this gauge transformation, uh, you can show that it, it matches upon the Fransdahl gauge transformation, okay? It's just basically will be the covariant derivative on a spin S minus one uh, gauge parameter if this is a spin S part. All right, so one important thing about uh, this extension is the fact that uh, we have to include all higher spin fields at once. Uh, so that is something that I already said last time, so it's an important feature. Uh, and it's related to the fact that once we introduce generators of spin greater than two, so once we allow something which is more than bilinear, then uh, this algebra uh, doesn't close unless we include all spins. So this can be seen in the following way. So this higher spin algebra is the algebra, is the star algebra of uh, these general uh, functions of Y and Y bars. It can be generated by monomials. So for example, this term of spin S1 would, would be terms of this type where N M with uh, N plus M equal to, uh, sorry, this you can see. N plus M equal to S minus one. So take these uh, generators and try to look at their commutators. S say you take the star commutator of uh, this with some S1 and S2 then if you use that the rule for the star contractions, uh, you find that this is a sum of generators okay so uh, now you see that if s1 and s2 are two, which means you are just considering uh, commutators of bilinears, you just get bilinears on this side. So that's the SO3,2 closed subalgebra of this big algebra. But as long as you uh, add something which is greater than two, you generate some other, monom some other monomials. For example, if you take a commutator of a two spin three object, star commutator, here you will get uh, P4 plus P2, so you generate a spin four. So you, if you have spin three, you have to have spin four, and you can go on. If you have spin four, you have to have spin six, and the algebra does not close uh, unless you include all of them, okay? 
Uh, so one can also see that there is, a, there is a, another closed subalgebra, but it's, it's still infinite dimensional. It's a subalgebra of uh, even spins. So that corresponds to the fact that we can truncate this algebra to even spins only, which is corresponds to ON models at the boundary. So there is, there is a subalgebra with even spins only. For instance, if you look at the commutator of P4 with P4, you get uh, P6, P4, and P2. Okay. Here, th so th this is for any of those terms schematically. It's uh, uh, it's not an exact uh, so. You can take any of this term such that n plus m is 2s minus 1. You generate these spins. So th this just counts the spin. Yeah, I'm not some. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, yes, there's a, all, all the generators which uh, are associated with spin s are those such that n plus m is 2s minus 1. So for example, for spin 2, there will be p and m. I will, I will call them spin two generators. Any other question? Well, I didn't really, um, If the cosmological constant is zero, uh, there is no way to make this. I mean, the limit is singular if you send r to zero. Here I'm setting r equal one, but uh, the, this, well, the interactions will be singular. They will involve inverse <coughs> powers of radius. Okay, I don't think I can uh, introduce uh, Vasiliev equations in the next four minutes. So uh, maybe I'll uh, stop for more questions.